Red Talks is a socialist project and center for social justice production, and Red Talks, hence the name, aims to do for socialist ideas what TED Talks does for Silicon Valley neoliberal entrepreneurialism and tech startups. <laughs> Red Talks, socialist ideas are worth spreading and debating um, and discussing. I want to now introduce the chair for today's meeting, uh, Paloma Villages, who will introduce the speakers and moderate the discussion, period. Uh, Paloma is a researcher, teacher, and artist who works at the intersection between migration, citizenship, race, and gender. So let's give a warm welcome to our Thank you, and welcome everyone. I also want to um, acknowledge the land on which the event is taking place. Um, as an uninvited guest from Mexico, I want to give thanks to, for the opportunity to be in this land. Um, I was also going to thank the a different book list, but also let's thank the Center for, uh, is it Center for Innovation, Social Innovation, uh, for hosting us. So as you are aware, uh, on July 1st, Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador, representative of the political party Morena, under a multi-party coalition with the name Together We Will Make History, was elected president of Mexico in a resounding victory. His party also gained important seats in both houses of Congress. Uh, Lopez Obrador has already began to plan his presidency. However, he will not be the official president until December. And so today, we would like to begin a conversation to contextualize the election and the challenges moving forward, particularly in relation to internal politics and Mexico's relationship with the US and Canada and Latin America. As a Mexican citizen and scholar of immigration and social inequality, I am particularly interested in how the election will shape Mexican immigration to the US and Canada, uh, the NAFTA negotiations, and the reception of Central American and other migrants in Mexico. I am excited to hear what our speakers have to say on these and other topics. And so let me just give you a little bit of a roadmap for today. We're going to begin uh, by hearing some short presentations from our speakers. And at the end, we're going to have some time for question and answer. Okay, so our first speaker is Colin Morse, who is co-founder and co-host of Mexelex, uh, which you can find at mexelex.com. He is a professor of politics at Ryerson University and has published a number of books as well as many articles, including Imperial Subjects, Citizenship in an Age of Crisis and Empire, uh, The New Imperialist Ideologies of Empire, Restructuring and Resistance, and finally, The Making of Bourgeois Europe. So thank you, Colin. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I'll just thank, uh, while chairs are being moved, uh, Dick and Tanner and whoever else was involved in organizing this panel this afternoon. Um, I just got back from Mexico about a week and a half ago. I was in the Zocalo on the, on the night with, I don't know, maybe 100,000 other people. Um, and I had been there for about six months. We started in January. The um, kind of multimedia website, independent media, organization that um, we started in January. We traveled from Chiapas to the border wall over the course of the, the six months. We were mainly talking to uh, journalists, independent journalists, social movement activists, obviously party political activists, most of them associated with Andreas Manuel Lopez Obrador's party Morena uh, in various parts of the country. We attended a lot of rallies, talked to a lot of uh, the organizers, people on the ground uh, in, um, um, I think it was March or February, we traveled down. We were based mainly in Oaxaca for the first four months of the project, traveling out from there to uh, Chiapas and uh, down to Juchitan in the southern part of Oaxaca and the isthmus of Tehuantepec, which is the narrowest part of Mexico and where much, most of the severe earthquake damage from last September's earthquakes. We say earthquakes because there were about 30 of them in that region, which is built on alluvial soil. So six months after the earthquake, uh, which destroyed 85% of the buildings and houses in Huchitan, which is a fair-sized city uh, with a long activist left-wing history. 
uh, there was still rubble everywhere. Our hotel, both buildings on either side, had collapsed and the back side of the, the hotel had collapsed, but they had rebuilt it so that we could, we could stay there. We uh, had a wonderful experience there interviewing uh, a, a colectivo called uh, Esquadron Hormigas, um, the squadron of ants. Uh, it was a collect collective of eight-year-olds uh, up to 14-year-olds who had self-organized when the terremoto, the earthquake, happened. Um, their whole barrio in the southern part of, of Juchitan was completely collapsed, including their school. They got on their tricycles and uh, met up in a central place and started uh, delivering uh, earthquake relief, tarpaulins, food, medicine, etc., etc. And that, to me, in a way, captures the spirit of, I think, and hope, uh, dream that uh, is, is going to unfold now, uh, not under a state of, of, of the gun, not under the state of, of repression, but uh, all of those wonderful uh, collective traditions which are so rich in Mexico, which I'll, I'll finish my comments on in a, in a, in a couple of minutes. Um, we, uh, as I said, um, travel around kind of chasing after AMLO in a, in a few places. Uh, he just happened to be uh, where we were in Puebla in uh, the end of April in a small rural town in uh, Tepeyaca, a rally of maybe five or six thousand campesinos. Um, I do not look like a Mexican uh, and I uh, really stood out in that crowd. Uh, Morena, the name you probably know, stands for Movimiento Regeneración Nacional, Nacional, the Movement of National Regeneration, but it's also uh, a clever reference to the fact that um, the dark-skinned Mexicans are, are called Morenas, um, and the working class of, of, of Mexico is overwhelmingly Morena. The campesino, uh, working class, in other words, race and class, are completely and utterly intertwined in, in Mexico. And, and at all of those rallies, uh, it was overwhelmingly uh, Morenas, right? Dark-skinned Mexicans who, who have suffered incredible exploitation, oppression uh, over many, many, many decades. Um, and the thing that we learned at a number of those rallies, because we would hang around afterwards and do sort of Vox Populi short uh, interviews with people say, what do you think uh, about what AMLO said today in his speech? Almost to a person, there was one person who wasn't, uh, but almost to a person, uh, they were quite a bit to the left of AMLO, I would say. And, and, and certainly the program that Lopez Obrador uh, ran on uh, over the months of the election. And I think that's um, very, very important because um, what we have now is, is a kind of breathing space where all of those social movements uh, who have, as I've said, you know, been, been under the gun literally, all of the uh, journalists, independent uh, journalists, social movement activists who have been uh, uh, murdered over the last, uh, well, the, really the last three sesenios, the last 18 years of right-wing governments in Mexico, now have a space to really begin to uh, reconstruct their movements, to push the movement forward, and above all, to push uh, Lopez Obrador's government itself to make sure it keeps the promises it's made, but also, I think, to be able to push it uh, further to the left. One thing that uh, really becomes clear when you spend time around uh, Morena activists is that they, these are people who have come out of social movements. Morena is a four-year-old political party, um, but it is really a party movement. Um, you know, this, the kind of thing that we're not particularly familiar with here because so many of our left-wing parties have become so institutionalized and, you know, shifted uh, over the last 30 years rightward. Uh, Morena still has those roots in the social movements, and I think that's very, very important for uh, the next period of time, because people are going to be expecting an end to the kind of impunity 
which has gone on around the disappearance of the 43 students at Ayotzinapa in 2014. Uh, just at the end of the Peña Nieto uh, government, they uh, have been forced by their own Supreme Court uh, to reopen the case because of the utterly shoddy investigation that, 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 that was done. Um, so people are going to be expecting an end to impunity, uh, uh, at least mitigation of the violence that people have been sub subjected to. I mean, it's, you know, can you think of another country outside of perhaps Syria where 200,000 people have died since 2006 as a direct result of the war on drugs? This is an absolutely astonishing figure, and yet, you know, most of the Western media, uh, you you know, just kind of passes over it in, in, in silence. Uh, or says, you know, they're all narco-traficantes anyway, why should we care if, if they're being killed in their tens and hundreds of, 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 of thousands? So it's a breathing space, I think that's, that's kind of number one. It's a space for organization. Uh, number three or two uh, is incredibly important for Latin America. I mean, the, the, the pink tide, of the early 2000s has been rolled up back in Brazil, in Argentina, in a whole number of uh, countries in uh, other parts of Latin America. There have been soft coups in a number of those countries as well, including uh, Honduras. Um, and uh, I think this is really going to give people a real shot in the arm. Mexico is and has been historically uh, uh, highly influential culturally, um, but also politically. You know, many of the exiled left intellectuals during the uh, era of the of military rule in Argentina, Brazil, uh, Chile, and other countries ended up in Mexico. Uh, and Mexico gave them a, gave them a refuge. So uh, I think there's a real significance there for kind of, you know, uh, revivifying or re-energizing the left, uh, which is already um, kind of re-emerging in, in Argentina with the big general strike there a couple of weeks ago. Um, but I also think it is uh, incredibly important for Latino and Latina struggles in the United States. I mean, the working class in the United States today is not the proverbial, you know, white guy in overhauls working in uh, the Chrysler plant. Sure, those workers still exist, uh, but it's, you know, the, the, the Latina uh, hotel worker in L.A., uh, you know, trying to organize a, a union. The, the, in one sense, the, the working class, the border between the Mexican working class and the, and the American working class is seamless. I mean, Dick writes about this in, in his book, and I think it's a very, very important point. The organizing traditions and the political culture uh, of Mexico, those workers bring that with them when they begin to organize and struggle in, in the United States. And we know uh, there are all sorts of, of, of struggles around the wall, racism, uh, you know, what new outrage will be visited upon us next week by the Trump administration, we, do, we don't know. Um, but I think it's certainly going to have a positive uh, influence on Latino and Latina struggles in, in the U.S. The, the final real point I want to make is the, the richness of the uh, uh, Mexican political culture. Uh, the legacy of the Mexican Revolution is very much alive. I mean, you go to any of these big rallies. We were in the Estadio Azteca with 107,000 uh, Morena supporters for the final rally two days before, three days before the election with uh, Lopez Obrador. All the symbology there is uh, the radical uh, legacy of, 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 of the revolution. Uh, uh, you know, Pancho Villa, Zapata, and, and so forth. So th those, those traditions are really palpable and alive. Um, you know, the 1917 Constitution is probably the most radical constitution in the Western world. I mean, bar none, we were just talking about whether or not that constitution actually allows for the privatization of, of the oil industry in Mexico. Many people argue, no, it, it doesn't, that the natural resources of Mexico remain the property of the Mexican 
people. We'll see what Lopez Obrador does around that. Uh, the, where I hang out for uh, close to half the year in Oaxaca uh, and Chiapas, the, the indigenous traditions are just incredibly rich there. They're communal, they're collective. Many of the pueblos, uh, small villages, are still run on the principles of usos y costumbres, the traditional indigenous way of organizing and political decision making, which is uh, collective and communal to its core. Uh, much of the land, despite the last 30 years of neoliberal assault, in a state like Oaxaca, 76% of the land is still uh, under communal control. And that has been absolutely central to fighting the depredations uh, of Canadian mining companies in that state who have really done uh, you know, a wrecking job um, there. Uh, in um, just this month, we were in Michoacan meeting with uh, some of the leaders of the self-defense organizations, Dr. Mireles and, and others. Uh, we went up into the mountains to a village called Cheran, which some of you might have heard about. There's a lot, been a lot of international uh, press, an indigenous village that uh, in 2011 uh, threw out the council, threw out the narco-traficantes, threw out the logging company, and threw out all of the political parties because of the violence associated with that. Now you might think, gee, that's pretty apolitical, isn't it? Throwing out political parties. No, it is, it is a deeply and profoundly political act in the context of the kind of violence uh, that's uh, associated especially with the, with the pre, uh, the institutional revolutionary party and, and uh, you know, the, the, the thugs that they uh, hire in this election alone, 125, uh, candidates were, were murdered, assassinated. Uh, so violence is, is, is a daily reality uh, for these people. So when you enter uh, Chiran, you go through a checkpoint with armed uh, indigenous guards with very heavy equipment. Uh, and when you leave, you check out. Uh, they have had no violence there uh, since um, 2011. The final thing I want to say is that, you know, Lopez Obrador uh, ends almost every speech he gave in this election saying there have been three great transformations in the history of Mexico. The independence, the, lever the revolution, the era of Lázaro Cárdenas, and the nationalization of the oil industry. Um, I stand for the fourth great transformation of Mexico. Now I hope that's true, uh, but in each of those three cases that he cites, there were attached to each of those events fundamental social and economic transformations of Mexican society. Campesino, the land distribution after, after the uh, revolution, uh, the nationalization of, of Pemex, or the creation of Pemex, the nationalization of the oil industry. Lopez Obrador has been somewhat timid uh, to talk in terms of fundamental uh, uh, social and economic transformation. He talks about the end of corruption, the end of violence, and these, these sorts of things. The breathing space that I talked about, and the, the really exciting thing uh, about this election, the, the, this resurgence of uh, the uh, Mexican people from below, uh, will tell the tale uh, whether or not they're able to uh, push Lopez Obrador and his government to keep those promises and push further towards much more fundamental uh, and radical transformations of Mexican society. Time will tell.